Hey, EP Statistics, welcome to chapter 12, our last chapter. In this section 12.1, we're going to be doing inference for linear regression. Um, so by the end of this section, you should be able to check the conditions for performing inference about the slope beta sub 1. We'll learn what that means as the true slope of the population uh, regression line. Uh, interpret the values of beta naught. Uh, beta 1, sigma, SE sub B1 in context, we'll go over all that, and determine these values from computer output, construct and interpret a confidence interval for the slope beta sub 1 of the population regression line, and perform a significance test about the slope beta sub 1 of the population regression line. So uh, some, some new concepts to think about here. So here we have a scatter plot, uh, and this is scatter plot of the duration in minutes and interval, uh, interval until the next eruption in minutes, of Old Faithful for all 263 eruptions in a single month. And so this is a population of eruptions for a for a month at least. Uh, the population least squares regression line is shown in blue. So there's a line of best fit, a least squares regression line for that. Um, so what we want to think about is when we are um, doing linear regression. A lot of times we're working with a sample of data and then we're we you know we're, we're trying to draw conclusions about a population. So keep that in mind, you know, that we could sample from this population. Um, so a regression line calculated from every value in the population is called a population regression line or the true regression line. Uh, the equation of a population population regression line is mu sub y equals beta naught plus beta one x. So we have, um, and this and this kind of changes. So um, the formula sheet actually used to be B naught plus B one X. Um, so you'll actually see this written as alpha plus beta X more often now because we have A plus B X. Um, but it's basically the Y intercept, the true Y intercept, and the true slope, where mu sub Y is the mean Y value for the given value of X, uh, and so you actually can get the the actual mean Y given a particular x value. So an x uh, input, you'll get the actual mean of all the y values, because you know, there might be a kind of a whole cloud of data points. Beta naught is the population y-intercept, or sometimes referred to as alpha, and beta 1 is the population slope, the actual slope between x and mu sub y. A regression line calculated from a sample is called a sample regression line, and that's what we've always done before, um, or the estimated regression line. The equation for a sample regression line is y hat equals b naught plus b1x, uh, or you could say a plus bx if, we, if you're going with a as the y-intercept, uh, where y hat is the estimated mean y value for a given value of x, b naught is the um, y-intercept, and b1 is the slope, or whatever values you're using for this. But a lot of times this is what you use, especially when we lead into multiple regression. All right, so here are scatter plots and least squares regression lines in green for three different simple random samples of 15 old faithful eruptions along with the population regression line in blue. Um, and so we've got here um, one sample slope, and sorry, the green is more kind of yellowish, I guess. Um, so the actual slope is this. But when we get a sample of 15, if we get these 15 red dots, you know, if we randomly sampled those, we get a regression line. And notice it doesn't exactly match. The wider steps a little bit off, the slope's a little bit off, um, but it's kind of close, and it will tend to be close. And so here's another one. Uh, again, the slope's slightly off, and so on. This and this one, um, same thing. And so the slope could be, you know, in this case, our slope is probably a little bit lower because it's not as much rise of a run, a little bit lower, and the slope's a little bit higher. In this case, our wider steps a little high, a little high, a little low. Um, so things to um, keep in mind when you're when you're dealing with this. So the sampling distribution of B1, or our sample slopes. Notice that the slopes of the sample regression lines, B1, you know, we're a few different slopes, vary quite a bit from the slope of the population. So the slope of the population uh, regression uh, was 13.29, and that should say beta sub 1. The pattern of variation in the sample slope beta B1 is described by its sampling distribution. So if we continue to do that, took a whole bunch of samples, we can actually plot all of the different slopes we get. So the figure here shows the dot plot of the sample slope B1 of the least squares regression line in a thousand simulated simple random samples of size 15. Uh, 
from those geyser eruptions, uh, the population slope of 13.29 is marked with the blue vertical line. So what we see there is it's, you know, the sampling distribution is centered there um, at the actual true slope, but sometimes our slopes are a little higher, sometimes our slopes are a little lower. Um, and so um, with that, um, uh, we want to be able to describe the shape, center, and spread of the um, sampling distribution of sample slopes. So the shape works out to be approximately normal. The shape of those sample slopes works out to be approximately normal. Um, the center is at the population slope um, uh, with 13.29. You know, in this case, the sample slope is an unbiased estimator of the population slope. Sometimes it'll be high, sometimes it'll be low, but we average out to that actual population slope. The spread. So this is a little bit, um, you know, a little bit different, and this and this shows up on your formula sheet. So the standard deviation of the slope is equal to sigma, and this is the um, the standard deviation of the residuals, the the true standard deviation of the residuals over um, you know, sigma sub x times square root of n. And so in this case, these end up being those numbers. You just take the standard deviation of your x values and then the sample size and so on. Um, and you can get an actual standard deviation. So where sigma sub x is the standard deviation of duration for the uh, eruptions. Um, and then, um, yeah, that all kind of summarizes there. So I guess that had shape, center, and spread, didn't it? So uh, to summarize all that, when we choose a simple random sample of n observations, so these are data points, so it's x, y coordinate pairs, uh, from a population of size n with the least squares regression line mu y is equal to uh, beta naught plus beta 1 or alpha plus beta x, let b1 be the slope of the sample regression line, then the mean of the sampling distribution mu uh, b1 is going to equal to the population slope, beta, uh, the standard deviation of the sampling distribution b1 is sigma, again that's the, the true standard deviation of the residuals, over sigma x times the square root of n. Um, as long as the 10% condition is satisfied, so the sample is less than 10% of the entire population, and the sampling distribution of B1 will be approximately normal if the values of the response variable Y follow a normal distribution for each value of the explanatory variable X. So this is our normal condition. Um, so at every va X value, we need a normal distribution, and I think this picture here shows it best. So at every X value, there's a normal distribution of our Y values, and so it kind of shows that normal curve plotted kind of above the line. So that's what we're looking for. Um, the way we'll actually check that is by looking at residuals. So when the conditions for inference are met, the regression model looks like the one shown here. The line is the population regression line, the true regression line. And actually it needs to be linear, uh, which shows how the mean response mu sub y changes as the explanatory variable x changes. For any fixed value of x, the, obs the observed response y varies according to a normal distribution. So we have that normal distribution throughout. Um, uh, having a mean of mu sub y and a standard deviation of sigma. And so that standard deviation is the standard deviation about the line, uh, about the residuals. So uh, it, it kind of ends up being uh, a bunch of conditions, uh, but they got a um, kind of a weird way of remembering it. So uh, suppose we have n observations of a quantitative explanatory variable x and a quantitative response variable y. Our goal is to study or predict the behavior of y given x. And so we've got all of these conditions, and I'll go ahead and show you how they tell you to remember it. It's linear, liner, it's not linear, like, but linear. All right, so first of all, is it linear? The actual relationship between x and y is linear. For any fixed value of x, the mean response um, of my falls in the population, uh, sorry, res sorry, the mean response, so that should be mu sub y. Uh, mu sub y falls on the population regression line. So there's actually a linear. And of course, the way we check that is, the best way to check that is with a residual plot. And so we'll do that. Uh, independent, the individual observations are independent of each other. When sampling without replacement, check the 10% condition. So that's you know, if you want to remember it that way, then 10% is fine. Uh, normal, uh, so for any fixed value of x, the response y varies according to a normal distribution. So here we'll look at our, our, our uh, a plot of our residuals, uh, and, and not the residual plot, but actually like a, some sort of like a histogram of our residuals, or uh, you know probably more likely a dot plot or a um, box and whisker plot, uh, to verify that it appears that the residuals kind of follow a normal distribution. 
equal standard deviation. Um, so the standard deviation of y, call it sigma, is the same for all values of x. So we don't want to, when we look at our residual plot, we want to see that it's kind of spread uh, evenly throughout. And then random, the data come from a random sample from the population of interest or a randomized experiment. So uh, here's the summary of how to check the conditions one by one. So the linear, examine the scatter plot to see if the overall pattern is roughly linear. Make sure there are no leftover curve patterns in the residual plot. And so in this case, this would be bad. Um, bad residual plot shows a curve pattern. This is good. Uh, scatter plot looks, looks linear. Uh, the independent condition, uh, knowing the value of the response variable for one student uh, individual shouldn't help predict the value of the response variable of other individuals. If we are sampling without replacement, uh, remember to check the, that the sample size is less than 10% of the population size. So it should be independent. N is normal. Make a histogram, dot plot, stem plot, box plot, or normal probability plot of the residuals and check for strong, uh, check for strong skewness or outliers. Ideally, uh, we would check the normality of the residuals at each possible value of x, but because we rarely have enough observations for each x value, uh, we make one graph of all the residuals to check for normality. Um, and so then uh, equal standard deviation, we want to see a nice equal spread throughout, looks like this. We don't want to see our residuals getting larger or narrower, that, that throws off our equal standard deviation condition. Um, and then uh, the random condition, see if the data come from a random sample from the population of interest or a randomized experiment. If not, we can't make inferences about a larger population uh, or about cause and effect. So uh, example problem here. Um, Mrs. Barrett's class did a fun experiment using paper helicopters. After making 70 helicopters using the same template, students randomly assigned 14 helicopters to each of five drop heights, uh, 152 centimeters, 203, 254, so on and so forth. Uh, teams of students released the 70 helicopters in a random order and measured the flight times in seconds. The class used computer software to carry out a least squares regression line analysis for these data. Here are the scatter plot, residual plot, and histogram of the residuals. So we want to check whether the conditions for performing inference about the regression model are met. And so we're going to go through that linear thing again. So first, uh, is it linear? And so we'll, we'll pick which plot to look at. In that case, uh, the best thing is, you know, really the residual plot. The scatter plot looks good, but the residual plot doesn't show any major curve uh, or patterns in that residual plot. The next one is independent, and so because the helicopters were released in random order and no helicopter was used twice, knowing the result of one option should not help us predict the value of another. We don't really have to check the 10% condition here because we can drop, I don't know, there's not a finite population of helicopters that we could drop. Then the N, normal, uh, so there is no strong skewness or outliers in the histogram of the residuals. So we took a graph of the residuals here, and that's what we're looking at. It looks, looks really good. Uh, and then the equal standard deviation, we come back to our residual plot. I don't think we don't see much spreading here. It kind of gets bigger in there, but we don't see spreading or converging on the residuals. So it's kind of evenly spread across. Um, so that looks good. Um, and uh, the random condition, uh, the helicopters were randomly assigned to the five possible drop heights. So remember the LINER acronym. Uh, and don't overact to, um, to minor issues in the graphs when checking the normal and equal standard deviation conditions. If things are a, a little bit off, again, we're just looking for major skew, equal standard deviation, yeah, they got a little bigger there, but it's, it's fine, it's, um, that, that's, that's good enough.